I've worked underground for years and years, and I've never really been seriously hurt. Jim Mortensen has been an underground hard rock miner for nearly 40 years. He has worked in mines throughout the American West and spent most of his career at the Sunshine Silver Mine in North Idaho's Silver Valley. Jim is a Jippo miner. He gets paid for what he produces and consistently outproduces others in the industry. Considered an expert in his field, Jim is highly skilled in the art of working with rock and machinery to mine safely and productively. This video is dedicated to Jim and others like him who are masters in the art of rock bolting. I think a young miner should pay attention to the guys breaking him in and hopefully they'll put him with somebody that knows what they're doing. Because if you, there's a, there's just like anything, there's 10 ways to do one job. And we've always, it don't matter how old you get, there's somebody that can tell you something. And if, you, if you've tried it, you didn't even tell him that, that don't work either, you know. But, but you always want to be able to take advice. The main thing you have to do when you go into a working place is you make it safe for yourself. You, you got to, you got to learn to do your own judgment on what's safe and what's not. And if you can do that, you're all right. If you start going by, waiting for somebody to tell you what to do, you know, say, well, you got to go bar that rock off. You got to, you better have it done before they ever come in. You know, this isn't like working outside. I could take you down in my heading and I could show you. Okay, first thing we got to do when we get in here is look at the back and the wire. First thing a guy should do is knock all this loose bolt, all this loose stuff out of the wire. Because if you don't, if you're rehanging wire, you'll end up getting it shattered down on top of you. And you know, and it's pretty easy to do, you know, lock it out. You don't have to go way back because that's all, all nothing's gonna fall through the rock. You just wanna get the big stuff. See, like this stuff back here, it won't fall on us anyhow because it, it won't vibrate off the edge. Okay. But you see, when you see stuff like this hanging off, you want to be sure and check it anyway. Wow. Well, we should have wet this down first to keep yeah. the dust down. But see now, you see how that rock kind of has a layer back this way? Yep. Well, anytime it's got a layer like that, you can tell like this stuff here, you want to check it because there's a good chance it's loose. It, it's, it's, this here bolt here has got it pretty well contained. Yeah. You see like that one there, it's, it's got loose muck around it. And you, that one there is very obvious. Now normally, when you, when I, whenever we run the drifts, we always, when you come in to wet down, you get up on the muck pile with a short bar. That way you're right up at the back where you can get good leverage and move around on it. Go ahead and play with it a little. You see them over there? Try them right there. That's it. Sometimes it's a never-ending battle. Yeah, you just say, get what you can get easy. Off. You always got to be careful. When you're barring way up high like this, yeah. if you bar a big one loose, sometimes it'll slide right down the bar. I 
that's enough barn day. They made these videos of us yesterday down there, and there's a lot of points we didn't go over. Now, you said you seen a few things you wanted to ask questions about, so go right ahead and ask, and I'll see if I can answer them. Okay, well, the first thing I noticed was um, we were using a really long bar, and in Scott's heading that we saw, he had he was up on the muck pile. Is that the preferred method? Well, I like the way Scotty did it because you're close to your work. And if you're close to your work, you don't have the rock. If it does fall and hits, it's only going to fall a few feet. And if you're 10 feet up into the back, it falls. If you're picking up speed, it's going to hurt more. So I, I've always liked to work close to the back. And uh, it's just a lot safer. But in our case, they'd mucked it out. And it was an old heading, so we just did the best we could. Okay. And I also noticed in his heading that there was a lot of water everywhere, puddles of water and things. I mean, is that, he washed down a lot more than we did. What's the reason for that? The reason you wet down is, is to settle the dust. If you don't settle the dust, you end up with it in your lungs, and then you're going to end up dead, you know, when you're young. Another thing, you've got to wash the face down real well. If you want to look for any mist holes, if there's a mist hole, you either got to wash it out or re-blast. Um, I also noticed too, like when I was barn down, I was just kind of tapping the rock, but you were really beating on it with this Galen bar. What were you listening for? Well, it's just, if you, when you tap it, you listen. And after you've been it for a while, you'll get to, to, to listen for, a, for a, a hollow sound. Then you'll know that sometimes the slab's real big and you can't see the crack. If you start tapping on it, you can see it start to dribble on one edge or something. It gives you a place to get your bar in. You're never going to get every pebble. Okay. So that's the reason you wear your arm guard and your safety glasses and your hard hat. If you, if you uh, knew everything was going to be perfectly clean, safe, you wouldn't have to wear no safety protection. You always try to make your working place safe. So you start right at, right at the end of the wire or the end of the mat, and you'll start working your way in. And once you get to the face, everything's safe. And you go ahead and set up and drill your round out and blast it. Okay, there's two ways you pack a jack leg. A lot of guys, they want to pick them up and just pack them like a baby. Now, the way I've always packed them, I've packed them this way for over 30 years, you just duck down under them, catch it on your shoulder, and pick it up. And that leaves this hand free, yeah. so you can grab your steel, which we don't want that one. But you've got to have, you, that way, if you're going very far, it gives you less trips. The way I pick them up, my back's always straight, so my back has never bothered me. When you get a machine down here, packing it like a, it, you're, it, they weigh 100 pounds or so, you know, and you're stumbling around over the rocks, it's going to affect you over the years. When you're, whenever you're drilling with anything, you never want to put your hands on top. Because if a rock falls down, it's going to break your hand. If you get a hold of it on the side or something, and, and you don't put a death grip on nothing, you just, just hold it. And it'll just knock your hands loose. And that's like even when you're running the machines, when you're drilling straight in, a lot of guys will get a death grip on it. You know, really hang on to it. And then they end up with carpal tunnel and all this garbage, you know, and their wrists hurt. It, uh, it's not necessary on a machine to... Once it starts drilling, they're simple, easy to run, which it won't be for you today, but someday down the road it might be. The only really way you get hurt on a jack leg is if you put your hands, when you're pulling them out of a hole, a lot of times the guy will pull it up and he'll grab it under here. Well, you can see, you see this tit right here? Yeah. If you get your finger in there like that, it's gonna hurt like hell. And the other part is on the chuck tender when you're putting steel in and out of it and you're flopping your chuck tender up and down a lot. Well, if you get them in too far, you're gonna pinch your fingers. I mean, those are the two main pinch points on a jack leg. And as far as running one, the, the, a lot of guys, when they set up a jack leg, they'll take and they'll get it and they'll set it up and they'll have it bent about like this angle trying to drill. Well, when you do that, you can see this, it's just common. You look at the angle of your machine. It's gonna push up. So they're sitting there with everything they got pulling it down. If you get that leg back, you want your leg, but you don't want your steel away from the face. If you take your jack leg, set it up, put a steel in it, and get it to where it's real comfortable. Then when you turn it on, it's just moseys right in. That's about all I can tell you about them until you start running one. And you don't want to, uh, if you have any questions, you just shut it off and ask. Now, I noticed um, you said if I had any questions I could ask you on the jack leg. I wanted to ask you about the angle. I wasn't quite sure what you meant by that. Well, Larry Evans, if you've, you've seen him drill, now he gets his machine, his leg way back. And it's something there, it pushes the machine in. It also has a little uplift, but it mainly pushes. So he's just standing there and relaxed. 
Now Mike, on the other hand, he has his leg way underneath it. So the machine's sitting there bouncing and he's hanging on to it and rolling around. And so it just, if you look at the two, you can see which one you'd rather be. You'd rather be like Larry than not fight the machine. If you fight the machine, you end up just wearing yourself out. You're off balance. That's when you end up falling down, breaking a leg, pulling a muscle, whatever. Now we should look the face over real close in case there's any missed holes. If there is, we got to wash them all out before we start drilling. Now you can see here this side of the face pulled real clean. Now this side over here, you can see a little bit of boot. Yeah. That's really, I wouldn't consider that bootleg. You always have one side pulls tougher than the other. It's a real safety factor. You should never collar when you're drilling your round. Like this hole here, say your line comes down, you should either drill a foot above or a foot below. If the hole's like six inches deep, yeah. if you're a foot above or a foot below, you can't ever hit it. All right. That's basically, now we better get our hoses. Okay, you always want to blow your air hoses out if you have any fine muck in these hoses. Mm -hmm. You get in your machine, your machine's only going to maybe last a half a shift. Oh. And then you spend all the damn day going to get another machine. Now this here, whoever put this hose away did a good job. You always should hook your hoses back to the oiler. It keeps any muck from getting in them that you can keep out. Yeah. <laughs> and this here is what's called a whip check. And the object of that whip check is if you screw this hose on and it accidentally comes off, they'll beat you half to death. And so you got to put the, make sure you put this whip check on. And then the hose, this here will be flopping around, but it, it won't hurt you. Now we got to fill it with oil. But first, before we fill it with oil, we'll blow the oiler hose out. I'll go back and turn the air on, and then we'll blow the oiler out. Good enough. Now, I always pour just a straighten the hose out. We don't want no kinks in it. Good enough. Bring it over here. Yeah. It won't run without a hook to the hose. Okay, tip it straight up. Uh, we, gotta, we have to uh, try to keep our mach machinery in pretty good shape. If we don't, we're going to be day pay and we might as well work and be working at McDonald's or something. Now this here is a uh, chain whip check. You always want to make sure these are on tight. If you don't have them on tight, they will hurt you when they come off. And this is your throttle. You always want to make sure it's in an off position. And this is your leg. You want it in an off position. Okay, so back. All right. Okay. Now we'll get our water hose. Turn that on just for a second. Turn that on just a little bit. Good. Shut it off. And the same thing goes for the water. You gotta wash them all out too. Now we'll fill our oiler and we'll be ready to drill. Okay, four or four. Now you see that's plumb empty. Oh, that's wow. the reason you put a little oil in your hose. Yeah. Because if you try to fire it up, it's going to take, you'll probably drill two holes before you ever get any oil out of this oiler to your machine. That's sufficient. Now, a lot of mines require you to wear these safety glasses when you're bolting or when you're drilling. Well, plus a lot of other times, but when you're bolting the back, you get a lot of water spray and stuff down in your eyes. So it's up to you if you want to try to wear them, that's fine. But like if you're in a bean hole or on a climber or any raise that you're running, it really gets difficult to, to drill up. When you're drilling the walls, it's fine. But sometimes they're a hazard if you're trying to mine up. So over the years, we've most of us have learned to duck. When you're collaring a hole, you'll turn your head a little and 
and the rocks fly away and the water goes away and then if you do get something on your face, you know, it just runs off. And if you do start wearing glasses, you've got to wear them because you get used to the protection, you know. And if, so they're, they're a real good thing. If you work in a lot of the mines anymore, you have to wear them all the time. But we've always been lucky because the mine's so hot that they don't make you wear them when, because they're fogged up all the time. You end up falling down and breaking your leg or something rather than poking your eye. I noticed yesterday underground, uh, we were wearing our safety glasses sometimes and not others. Why do we wear safety glasses or when do we wear safety glasses? Well, we should wear them at all times. With me, it's, it's kind of habit not to wear them because for years we never wore them. It was too hot. See, when we first hired out at the Sunshine, it was over 100 degrees, 90 to 100% humidity. And it was just, I mean, you walk in and you're dripping wet. And, and when it was hot, though, you couldn't wear them because of the fog or the... Well, they fog up, plus the, you got your sweat and stuff running on them. You know, if you bend down, they're covered up. You just can't see through them. And then it's a hazard. But as long as they can keep the mine ventilated to where you can, can keep them clean, it's a, it's, it's a good thing. Okay, but that'll protect you from rock chips. And also, like, we were barring down, and noticed some sparks coming off the rock. That's right. another... You see the sparks flying off when you're barring down, or when you're collaring a hole, you'll see the stuff fly. We years ago, we'd always just duck our head, you know, and sometimes you raised it too quick, you know, and you'd get something stuck in your eye. So it's, it's a good idea to wear your safety glasses at, at all times. All right. I noticed yesterday another thing, uh, you were wearing arm guards when we were scaling and bolting, and I wasn't. And if that's something I'm going to be doing, should I be wearing arm guards all the time? or? Well, your arms are just guinea. I don't think you could stay on. <laughs> Plus, like, if I get all the way well, to rock faster. No, right? you should. You should wear your arm guards at all times for the simple reason if you're going to, you're going to get cut, you know, if you don't wear them. Because there's going to be rocks, you know, falling and hit you and, and muckers and there's, there's always something catching you and, you know, and you get scratched up. So it's a, if you got the safety equipment furnished for you, you should wear it. You can see a lot of old of us older guys that never wore arm guards. We have a lot of little nicks and scratches on them. Okay, this is one type of earmuff. The type that I'll be wearing today, yours is on your hat. Now for the first, no, 10, 12 years I mind, you never even wore earplugs. Never, nobody even knew we even had them. So then we went to earplugs, and then here lately, after we're already deaf, and they don't do you no good, they make you wear them. But it's for somebody like yourself, you should always wear double ear protection. Anybody that's just breaking in in the mine should always wear them. Because you don't want to end up like me, you know, the, you get somebody saying hello and you don't know what the hell they said, you know, unless you get right in your face. And sometimes they call you a dumb son of a bitch and you say, yeah. Okay, the reason we keep everything out of the way like this, you always stack it to where you ain't going to trip over it. You know, when we take it up to the face, you want to stand it back, keep it back out of the way, because if, and just lean them against the wall, because if, a, if you're out here bolting, you know, drilling a hole, and the slab does come down, you jump back. Yeah. That's the least thing you want to do is trip over your bolts. And now we're going to start drilling. We'll stand back right at the edge of the wire and we'll lay out and we'll put a, like a bolt here and one over here. Now we're going to fan them bolts in the back so that if, you're, if you drill your bolt, say you drill the hole straight up, in this type of ground it would be real good to do that. You've got a lot of ground where you'll, you'll get slips, you know, that run, run across. And then you want to make sure you fan because if you can get an arch in your bolt, the, the anchor is way at the back. So if you, if you sit here and you fan out, you don't want to fan too much. You want to try to keep your, your bolt board and your head. You always want to try to, when you put it in, you don't want it cocked like that. You don't want to over tighten the split set or you'll break the ring on it. And that's another thing, you have to try to have them square with the ground. If you try to put them in and the bolt sets it, it pops the ring and then the bolt's useless. Now, see, if we were gonna, if we say we were going to put six bolts across the back, we'd set up over here on this side. We'd, we'd set up then one, two, three, and then come over here and go one, two, three. And that, them outside bolts, he'd be plumb outside the wall. That's the object of that. If you if you drill over two or three holes at a time, you re, you're loosening the ground. So if you and plus you you have to move ahead. So if you if well, some guys will do it, and you you'll go in and you look at a look at bolts and like say this is your back and they'll have their bolts in at this angle on a 40. Them bolts aren't no good because any slough around that bolt 
that bolt just it just falls out. I mean, it's not holding it. You take a four foot bolt and put it in at that angle, you only got maybe two and a half, three feet actually holding the ground, and that's no good. And then you got to take a long bar, hold your wire out, shove it up against the face, and you're always under the wire yeah. all the time. And it, you, you really can't get hurt that way at all. Most you're going to get the scratch. Now with these type of bolts, you can have stuff fall, like you'll be drilling here, you might have that piece right there fall off. So you always want to be watching the back all the time. The only drawback to wire on the walls is if you get some truck drivers and loader operators and aren't paying attention, they'll end up hooking it and then you'll have big chunks of wire sticking out and then you end up getting some, I've had one kid damn near got his eye ripped out with one. But other than that, you just have to, it goes right back to the basics, you just got to watch and look. Whenever I put in a, a bolt, a mini mat, or a, a bolt board, whichever you're using, I always try to position the board or the mini mat to where it's covering the ground the best. If the ground has a slight dip in it, you want to turn your board to where it sets up against it. When you're bolting with a mini mat, you got to catch the, the hump, the bellies. You put it in the, actually in that belly to hold it. Now, if you're, if you're using wire or long mats, then you go into the valley, the holes, because your mat or your wire will wrap around the big hump and it'll hold it. But if you try that without with the mini bat, then you've got that big belly, it's going to fall off. So if, it depends on what you're, actually what kind of bolt you're using, where you put it. When you're bolting, like bolting the hanging wall of a stove, you'll, you'll set up where we were using six foot mats, so we'd just put two bolts in the mat. So we'd cut up and we'd gently bolt from the face back. And you drill your two bolts and you hang your mat. And then you bring your machine back approximately five feet. You want just a little pull on that mat since you're only putting two bolts in it. So you put just where it'll just pull that mat and make it pull real tight. If you put just a little little angle on that last bolt, on the bolt just just a little, not much, and it'll pull that bolt real that mat real tight, and it really holds the ground good for the full six foot. If you try to, if you set up too far away and you drill in, then you're going to collapse your mat, and your mat's useless. So then you either take your driver, your split set driver, or your pipe wrench. I'd used my pipe wrench for years, so I still use it. You stick it in the chuck of your machine, and when your mat goes up against the wall that chuck will stay down. If you don't keep that chuck tender down, when you come off of the steel, the steel is going to stay in the hole. So then here you are standing there with your jack leg, and you got to lay it down and then go wrench the steel out. You just lose too much time. Let's see if we can make this turkey run. I noticed yesterday that you climbed up on the jack leg a couple of times as the machine got up towards the back. And for somebody who's just starting out, I don't think I could do something like that. Is there something else you suggest? Well, 
I, the air can turn on you and stuff, and really they want you to use a ladder anymore. A lot of mines flat, you know, you to step up on the D-ring. And if, if, you, if your back's really high, you know, say 10, 12 feet high, you, you can't reach out and touch your machine off. So you, if you just have a short ladder, five, six foot ladder, throw it up against the machine and run up there, that's a safe, safe way to do it. Um, but a lot of us have been mining as many years as I have. We'd, we've did it for so many years. It's habit forming, and you just, if something does happen, you just let go and jump off. And we have, I had one friend one time get, he was next to the wall, and it swung and caught him, and it spun him around, and he didn't have a shirt on, and it tore the hide right off of him. And it, it, so in his case, he should have had the ladder. But it's, it's preferred to have a ladder there. And then you could also, like, if you have the, the muck pile up higher, too, just like with scaling, it would probably be easier. Right. But the, the goal is to keep it safe, basically. Yeah. And you've got you to work at it yourself. You know, you can't just expect everybody else to make it safe for you. Now, the reason we bolted like we did here, if you notice that there's a kind of a fault there that runs up behind, well, that's the reason I tried to get two bolts right at the edge of that. And that'll hold it up to where it can't keep eating out as it goes across. See, the rest of the ground is all keyed in to that slip. Once, they, once you catch that slip, that's what I was telling you before, you know, you kind of want to always go through a slip if you possibly can, and it'll, it'll catch it, and then the rest of it's pretty secure. You'll have a, a bolting pattern that they recommend, and it might be like four across and something like that. But if you ever see, it's just like here, we could have come in here and say, well, that's there, and we only want four bolts across, so we put one, two, three, four. Well, that would not support that fault. Yeah. They'll never, I've never had a supervisor or anybody ever bitch about you putting in one or two extra bolts to secure the ground. You always want to make it safe for you. If you're in ground that's blowing up a lot, air blast, and you can hear it, that's when you turn your jack leg on so you don't listen to it. No, but you can, you can tell. and. It depends on the ground you're in. Some ground, ground rock will, if you're in real air blast ground, it'll, you'll pick it and it, the rock will clink just like a piece of china. It's real brittle. And if you get into that kind of ground, then you really, and she starts talking to you, starts working, and you'll actually see the ground move. Then you know you're, you're in bad ground because if it blows on you, it's going to cut you. You know, if you're, in a, if you're in ground that's not working, that's good ground. I mean, you, you, you tell by your bolts. 90% of you, if, you if you're in ground and, you, and your bolts aren't being mushroomed or your timber's not being really squeezed, you don't have to worry about that ground. And it is quiet. It'll be just pure quiet. And that's perfect ground condition. If, you, if you're in ground where your mats or you, and your plates are starting to turn over and it's popping the heads on your bolts, and then she's creaking and banging. Then it's when you watch out. When your ground's quiet, it's some of these guys say, "Oh, she's going to be real quiet before she blows up." I've been in some of the biggest air blasts here at Sunshine, and it wasn't that quiet when it, you know, it wasn't. It just they just blow, you know. When it when it gets time, they blow. You always watch. It's just like when we when you're drilling that drilling here, you're watching all this rock all over because it's going to fall. There's only a little piece, and if you pay attention, you won't get hurt. That's, that's the main object, is not to get hurt. Because you ain't going to make no money if you're in the hospital. And that's the whole name of the game of Jippo, is making money. Oh, yeah. You want to make the most money, anybody in the mine. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the main object. And then, like, if you and I end up partners and we're on a heading, it's going to be a race. Because I'm going to beat you every day. <laughs> and if you don't try to beat me, you ain't going to be worth a damn. Yeah. I mean, that's, that makes it fun. Because oh, yeah. you, uh, you'll get done, all of a sudden you look at your watch and say, Jesus, it's time to go. You know, that, that was what, we, you're always wanting more time. Yeah. And that, that was what was fun about mining. If you got a straight steel, when we come out of a hole, we come out wide open and we'll go to our next hole wide open when we're drilling the face. And if you have a bent steel, sometimes you can't, you got to back off because your steel is sitting out here going around and around and around like a drunk and you're trying to get it in one certain spot. And if you have straight steel, you can just just dab them, just bam, bam, bam. You know, it's fun to drill. Real, really, it's real fun to. You're always seeing who can out drill the other one, who can out bolt the other one. And it, it, it makes the day go by real fast. When you're side by side with somebody, that's when you really got to pay attention to your steel. And you gotta, you gotta always have your hands ready just in case that steel breaks, so you don't 
spear him in the middle of the back or something like that. Well, if you get, get within three or four feet of the face, you turn loose your machine, you know, and you'll reach out there and start digging out for your lifters. So if you do that, you want to get it a little closer to the face. You want, and then you want to make sure that if, when it does break, your, your machine ain't going to fall down and hit you. You know, you'll be off at one side or the other. You never want to get right under your machine. Because we had one guy at the shine there that it broke and went right through his shoulder. And he ain't worked a day since. It takes a long time to learn. I'm still learning, you know. There's still a lot of things I don't know about mining. But, and then every mine you go to, there's different equipment. I'll teach you to do it my way. But you're going to learn a lot of different people's ways. And then it's up to you to pick out the best way for you. If, you have a, if you're working two shifts on a job, you always want, it's always nice to try to leave your opposite crew set up the way, they, the way you want to be set up and talk to them. Because if, if you get good communication between your opposite crew and you, then it, it's just like they ain't even there because you're going to follow yourself. The only thing is it'll be twice as much advanced. And if you take something that's hung on the wall 30 feet back, when you get done with it, put it back there. Then he knows where it is. And then, they, then they're not running all over the damn drift looking for it. And they know right where to go to get it if they need to patch a hole. If there's, and there's always something you can do down here, you know, to make your heading that much better. It's just simple, simple things that you don't have, I mean, you, you don't have to be very bright. You just, to, to, you just have to pay attention and you get a routine down to where you know exactly, you got your bolts right there, you make them up as you're working. And uh, you, you just, if you watch everything you do, and if you run your machine, make it easy. You know, like I say, if you, can, if you use your whole body to run a machine, it's, it's, it's just easy, you know. I, mean, it, I don't know how to explain how, how you run them, but I mean, I can, I've taught a lot of people, and generally I can get it across to them how to run them. And it just makes it fun. Plus, you might make a dollar that day.